Today, I had a really good tidy up in my shed, and right at the back, under a load of stuff, I found a couple of old S1 250 triple engines. So what I'm gonna do is cut them both in half and join them together to make it into a four cylinder of either 350cc or maybe 530, depending on which barrels I use. These two old Kawasaki triple engines have been sat in my shed for years under piles of stuff, but I dug them out and on quick examination they look to be in good condition. The crankshafts are free and the big ends feel really smooth. It's a nice sunny day, so I take them out into the garden and start stripping them down, first removing the very delicate and neutral switch. The clutch cover is held on with non-standard cap head screws, so they come undone really easily. But before I remove the cover, I first remove the oil pump. This is in really good condition, but I won't be using that because it's only got three outlets and I need one with four. The next thing I do is to remove the clutch pressure plate retaining screws. And my impact drill makes light work of undoing the centre nut, then the clutch simply pulls off the main shaft. Followed by the gear selector shaft, this just pulls out through the engine. The screws holding the oil catcher and selector drum in place are very tight, so I use my impact screwdriver. This makes light work of it. I've seen a lot of these oil catchers with a broken stub where people have left them on the engine when they split the crankcases, but it's really important this stub's there because it feeds oil into the gearbox. With the crankcase nuts undone, the bottom case just lifts off and you can see the crankshaft and all the gears inside. So I lift out the gears first and then the crankshaft and it all looks in really good condition. I then remove the C-clip and slide out the selector shaft followed by the selector drum. Well that's the first engine stripped, now on to the second one. Now the second one looks like it's been apart before because there's gasket cement oozing out of all the joints. This engine certainly seen some use when I removed the bottom cover as thick black gunge in the bottom and lots of gasket cement oozing everywhere. I first lift out the crankshaft and that looks to be in excellent condition on the outside but we'll see more when we strip it down. Also the gearbox looks to be in good condition so now I've got two gearboxes to choose from I'll just pick the best one. I've now got a nice pile of crankcase parts ready for cleaning, but I look up and the pigeon has got his friend the sparrow around to have dinner and they're just pecking away at all the food. I lay out a plastic sheet on the grass and spray the parts with my pink bike cleaner. Then give it a good wash off with a jet wash, getting rid of all the loose oil and mess. I'm not too worried about getting them really clean at this stage because they're going to be vapor blasted after I've done the sawing. With both sets of crankcases on the bench, the first set will be cut in the middle and I'll keep the right hand part and the second set will be cut there and I'll be keeping the left hand part. So two and a half cylinders plus one and a half cylinders equals four cylinder. So the next thing I need to do is mark a little mark next to the crankcase mounting point. Turn the crankcase on its side and use my scribing block to scratch a line around the crankcase. This is where I'm going to be cutting with my hacksaw. The sharp point of the scribing block leaves a nice line on the oxidised aluminium surface of the crankcases. With the line scribed, I grip the crankcases tight in the vise, making sure I grip on a part that's not going to be needed. Then I use my hacksaw and I cut down the line, separating the crankcase into two pieces. It can take quite a while to cut the crankcases in half and you have to attack it from many different angles but the main thing is, is to saw through the metal gently letting the blade cut without being forced and you'll get a nice straight line. Well that's the first side cut through so now I turn it around to cut the other side. Thank you. 
Well, that's the first cut complete on the top half of the crankcase. So now I've got to repeat the process on the bottom half. Castings can be really thick in places, so sometimes you need to put a bit of oil on the blade to help it cut. Well that took quite a while, but I'm through in the end, so that's the right hand set of crankcases cut. So now I'll be cutting the left hand set of crankcases in the centre this time. This is much trickier to do. Before I can start cutting, I need to remove this hardened dowel because it's right in the line where I want to saw. So I turn the crankcase over and tap it out with a pin punch. And it comes straight out. I can now start cutting. There's quite a lot of cuts on the upper crankcase to get where I need to go. You have to do it a little bit at a time, but you get there in the end. After about 20 minutes of cutting and a lot of perseverance, I'm finally there and the portion of crankcase is removed. I'll have a quick look to see how it fits and I'm really pleased with that. And after a little bit of machining, that's going to fit just perfect. I now grip the bottom crankcase in the vise and cut to the right of one of the central fins. I need to keep the left hand rear engine mounting point, so I cut down the side of the webbing with a saw, and then after a bit of cutting, I'm through, and that section of crankcase is now removed. So the next thing I need to do is put all the parts on my miller machine and mill them up so they're nice and smooth. The next thing I do is clamp the right hand crankcases onto my miller machine table with the rough saw on surfaces pointing upwards so I can mill them nice and smooth. The cast aluminium material machine is really nice. After a couple of cuts, the surface is now clean. So I take a steel bar resting on the surface that I've just machined and measure down to the side of the transfer port and get a dimension, which needs to be half the width of the original crankcase dimension. I mean, it is absolutely spot on. So I'm really pleased with that. So the next thing I can do is start machining the other side. I start milling the surface and keep going until I go down to the line that I've scratched on my scriber. With the machining complete on the left hand crankcase part, I offer it up to the right hand crankcase part and it fits perfect. And I double check the dimension and it's exactly right. So I'm really pleased with that. The next thing I do is use my rotary carbide burr in my electric drill to do the weld preparation to all the joints. Then I use a file on the flatter edges With the weld prep done, I take the crankcases over to RD Cox & Son in Reading for vapour blasting, and when it returns, they're like brand new. The crankcases are now all ready for welding, but before I can weld them together, I've first got to make up a marn drawer that goes through the central main bearing journals. But I've got one in stock that I use on my Z1 Super 6. It's exactly the same diameter, and that fits into the crankcases just perfect. So I can align the two bottom crankcase parts, drop in the, the marn drawer, and it holds it in line longitudinally while I weld it together. I now place on the upper crankcase parts. And 
And here you can see the marlin drawer in the centre holding it all in line. So the next thing I do is turn it upside down and lightly do up the crankcase nuts. With the nuts tight, I turn the crankcases back over to check that the barrel mounting points are all in line. I use a steel rule and I'm looking for light through the gap. And these are just perfect, so I'm really pleased about that. So now I can tip the crankcases up on their end and tap them down to make sure the gap is closed right up. We don't want any gaps. If you've got gaps, this can cause distortion in the welding process. When TIG welding aluminium castings, it's best to preheat the metal first, so I take it out into the garden and put them in my barbecue. It does the job just perfect. While the crankcases are warming up, I pop into the kitchen and Trace is making mincemeat oat cookies. They look really nice. She's already got some Guernsey butter and brown sugar in the mixer being whisked up into a creamy paste. And then she adds some flour. She then checks the recipe book and then puts the mixture into a bowl, spooning it in a bit at a time, and then adds some oats, followed by some mincemeat. And a bit of honey. She then mixes all the bits together by hand using a stick until they are even consistency. With the mixing complete, she spoons it out onto the baking tray in equal sized lumps, then puts it in the oven for 15 minutes, and when they come out, they are absolutely amazing. I can't wait to try one, but I'm told to go back out in the garage and do my welding, because they're going to take ages to cool down. I go back out to the barbecue to retrieve my crankcases, and they are really hot, I can barely touch them, so I use a bit of cloth and get them straight into the garage onto the bench. I get straight on with the welding while the crankcases are really hot. This really helps with the welding process. I put several tack welds around the crankcase first before I do the proper welds. This helps to minimise distortion. With all the external welds complete, I can now file down the welds that span the crankcase joint. If there are any dips or low points, I can add more weld. But this is just perfect, so now I can split the crankcases to do the internal welds. The mandrels are really tight fit in the main bearing journals. I have to give it a tap with a hammer to remove it. So now I'm all ready to do the internal welds. I hear a tap on the door. Tracy's brought me out a cup of tea and a cookie. That looks so nice, so I'll just eat that first, and then I'm going to get straight on with the welding. With the welding complete, I use my rotary burrs to start cleaning up the welds, starting with the coarse one. I gradually remove material a little bit at a time until I retain the original contour. I then use a file just to clean along the front edge. With the surface reasonably smooth, I use my fine carbide burr to try and recreate the cast finish.
To finish off, I use a bit of Abronet cloth. This can take quite a while to get the finish you're looking for, but you have to persevere and you get there in the end. I then use my rotary carbide burr to remachine the oil gallery in the top surface of the crankcase. I then turn the crankcase over in the vise, gripping its height on the rear engine mounting point so I can refile the crankcase joining surfaces. I have to make sure I only file the weld, so I use a succession of files right down to my very finest one and then finish off with emery paper until it's really smooth and you can't feel the joint. I then repeat the process with the bottom crankcase. When I'm almost down to the surface, I use the file sideways, which is called draw filing. It removes a finer amount of metal, and you can feel it's really smooth with your fingers. I'm well pleased with that. So now I can refit the mandrel and refit the top cases and bolt them up tight. Bolting the crankcases back together onto the mandrel after welding helps to stabilise the material and minimise distortion. Well, the crankcases are basically finished and they look amazing. I'm really pleased how they turned out. But I'm going to be fitting the S3 400 barrels and they have slightly bigger protrusions on the bottom. So I have to bore out the crankcases to suit. I mount the crankcases onto my milling machine table and incline the head over at 19 and a half degrees in line with the mouths of the crankcase. And as you can see here, it's not much to come out, maybe about a millimetre and a half. I'm using an adjustable boring head in the milling machine. This allows the cut to be increased gradually until the correct diameter is reached. I feed the cut down by hand. I take a few cuts, then check with my Vernier caliper, and the size is just right. So I check the barrel on the crankcases, and it fits perfect. I'm really pleased with that. With the machining complete, I remove the crankcases and put them back on the bench, and try all four barrels, and they look just great. I hope you enjoyed the video. The four cylinder crankcases are now finished and the S3 400 barrels fit perfect. So this engine is going to end up about 550 cc with oversized pistons. So it should absolutely fly. In the next video, I'm going to be showing how I made the crankshaft.